Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Ted Peterson, and I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And today is Sunday, May 15th, uh, 2016. And um, tomorrow, May 16th, uh, 2016, uh, marks one year of um, Adam Kilgariff uh, passing uh, away uh, at age 55, uh, far, far too young. Uh, but with a, a rich uh, life, rich history of work behind him. And um, uh, Adam was a computational linguist, a computational lexicographer, a lexicographer. He had interests in word sense disambiguation and semantics and polysemy and collocations and, uh, in fact, a lot of the same interests that I have. And um, uh, Adam, in as I've reflected on uh, Adam's life um, and, and his work, I've realized uh, he had quite an impact on me. And I think I've known that, but I, I, I don't think I quite appreciated it um, until really engaging in that kind of process of reflection. And so I wanted to, to share some of those thoughts um, and explain some of those connections um, in, in, this, in this small sort of way. Um, and if you don't know Adam, if you're watching this just out of curiosity, um, that's Adam. Uh, he's in the middle. Um, and this, this picture was taken in 2003 in Mexico. And this is, um, he's with Diana Inkpen, who's wearing black, and uh, uh, Caroline Gasparin uh, in the white hat there, the blue, wearing the blue. And Diana's holding a, a monarch butterfly. And this picture was taken at the uh, uh, wintering site of the monarch butterfly, which is uh, just outside of Mexico City. Uh, we were there in Mexico City for the Sickling Conference, which was taking place in February of 2003. And so I just thought this was kind of a nice, a nice photo um, to, uh, to to have a picture of uh, Adam in your mind. Um, and so uh, Adam and I, uh, I know we met in person roughly in about 1996-1997. And uh, I was a PhD student at the time, uh, finished my PhD in 1998, um, and Adam finished his PhD I think actually in 1993, and his dissertation uh, was entitled Polysemy, uh, having to do with sort of the multiple meanings of words. And um, uh, he seemed a bit wiser to me than than someone who had finished in 1993, perhaps. But um, but in any case, um, we had corresponded before meeting, I believe, um, or at least I had seen him very active on the corpora mailing list, uh, where he was a a, a presence and an interesting um, raconteur for for decades, actually. Uh, but in any case, I was at and as was Adam at some big conference, um, probably I'm thinking AAAI uh, in 1996 or, or possibly 1997. And this is one of those big conferences that, uh, this was back when AAAI, uh, which is an AI conference, uh, still drew a lot of natural language processing, computational linguistics people. And I was sitting in, you know, one of these big rooms where people are giving talks and, they're, you know, it's overly air conditioned and this particular room at this particular time wasn't very, um, there weren't many people there actually, so there were a lot of empty seats. So in those situations, I always look for like the largest area with the most empty seats and I sit right in the middle of it. Okay, and so this is like, if you imagine this is sort of Jeff Conway's game of life, I'm, I'm pursuing a strategy to sort of guarantee extinction, actually, by, by being that isolated. But that's, that's what I like to do. I still do that uh, when I can. In any case, I was sitting there, and I was not particularly happy. And I don't quite remember why. I think initially those early conferences for me were, were difficult, actually. I didn't know many people. I felt like what I was doing was very small, very minor, incremental at best, not interesting, and I really kind of questioned why I was there. Uh, you know, what, what, what possible reason do I have to be here presenting this kind of trivial stuff? I mean, it's a, it was kind of an imposter syndrome at work, I suppose, maybe. Um, and so in any case, I'm sitting there listening to a talk, and all of a sudden, behind me, much to my surprise, uh, I hear someone, and I, I hear this voice that's kind of like, you know, I really liked what you did with those exact tests. And I just sort of like, you know, what in the world? And I turn around, and of course, 
It was Adam. I don't know if I knew I knew it was Adam right away, but he kind of stuck out his hand and he said, Adam Kilgariff. And I said, oh, yeah, uh, Ted Peterson. And he said something like, oh, yes, I know that. And, uh, and of course, you know, you don't randomly go around saying you like something you did with exact tests just to anybody, I guess. But um, in any case, indeed, um, Adam and I had a kind of a, a common interest in identifying collocations, you know, pairs or sequences of words that in sort of statistical parlance are often said to occur together more often by chance. Uh, but as Adam would be very quick to point out, uh, he would say, uh, you know, that language, in language, n there is nothing ever that occurs by chance. And uh, it, uh, there's a, a, a paper of the title, um, Language is Never Ever Random, and which kind of expresses that. And um, indeed, the point he makes uh, and made is that there are quite a few assumptions made by the different statistical technique, techniques we use to measure, for example, the properties of words and how they occur together or not that make these assumptions that are in the end not really true about language. And, you know, we use these sometimes realizing that, sometimes not, and sort of uh, hoping to get some kind of interesting uh, result from that. Uh, but, but Adam was very good about pointing out, well, at least be aware that these assumptions you're making are really, you know, kind of nonsensical. And I guess the exact test work appealed to him because exact tests at least don't make those same kinds of assumptions of normality that, for example, chi-square tests make. And I think Adam had done some work previous to that, uh, arguing, you know, something similar about uh, these normality assumptions that 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 you know collocations and language aren't normally distributed really um, and so uh, and so it was it was a very genuine sort of comment I felt it's like oh well you know and and it was it was surprising to me because at that point in my career I mean this is just a couple of years in and and it's probably true even now it's kind of rare when people just walk up and say something nice you know usually there's this kind of ritualistic bowing of oh I like your I love your work and they say I love your work too and nobody really knows what work we're talking about but we love it we just love it but this was a really genuine kind of remark. And I knew who Adam was. I knew his name. And uh, I know I had seen some of his postings on the corporate list and, and some of his, uh, his work uh, as well. And, uh, and it was really quite um, gratifying. Um, and it was a, 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 you know, a small you know, 30 second exchange that I still remember. I remember it very clearly. And I remember at the time it had a really powerful impact on me. And I think it taught me something very important very early on is that sometimes, you know, a few kind words genuinely meant uh, really can do so much more than the effort it takes to, um, to share them or to provide them. And, uh, and that was, I thought, a, a, a kind of a wonderful thing. And I think it's something that, um, you know, I think uh, Adam was was quite good at um, that is providing those kinds of of, of encouraging words. Um, now Adam, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's there's a paper. The paper I mentioned about language is never ever random. I'm looking at it right now, actually. Uh, this was actually published in um, 2005, and and so reflects. Uh, quite a lot of the work he had done before that. You can go back and find earlier papers, but this is this is a pretty nice, uh, a very good actually uh, discussion of a lot of the issues about um, some of our statistical tests and why maybe some of these assumptions that, that they make just aren't very helpful uh, or are potentially misleading if we're not careful. And um, Adam was very good uh, one of the things I really liked about him and his work is that he was kind of good at kind of pulling at these loose threads. And um, soon after uh, the 2000, this 2005 paper, he had a a, um, uh, a column in the Computational Linguistics Journal in a column called Last Words, which meant which, and still means the last piece in the journal for that edition, that issue. Um, and it's meant to be kind of a thought-provoking, uh, even provocative topic. And uh, he did one uh, in 2006 uh, called Googleology is Bad Science. I really like this. This was, this was a, uh, a very timely paper, I think, because uh, natural language processing, computational linguistics had kind of discovered 
the web. I mean, the web had been around for a long time, but um, it kind of discovered the web. And um, we were, um, we were um, using search engines to get um, word counts and identify patterns and things like that. And Adam goes through a whole series of concerns about that, um, about why that can potentially bis be misleading and how the search engines are doing something different. Um, you know, we're counting pages, not words. We're, we're doing different kinds of things with lemmatization and so on and so forth. And it's a very blurry, messy thing. And if we, if we rely on that, we're, we're kind of subjecting ourselves to the whims of people like, you know, Google and Yahoo and how they choose to, to, to manage their search engines and how they, how they um, uh, decide to provide results for us. Um, and all the while, they have for their internal use these massive corpora that aren't subject to those kinds of constraints and limitations that they can use for their work. And so I think he was making a case there that in a sense if you if you sort of rely strictly on what Google or Facebook or Yahoo or whoever give you, you're putting yourself at a, a fairly significant disadvantage potentially to the work they're doing. And so do you want to just sort of seed the field to the, to the folks that have the really big data centers? Um, and he was saying, well, no, you don't. You want to try and maybe create something uh, of a similar scale or larger, large enough, whatever that might mean, uh, that can be used in an open way by academic researchers. Um, and I think that kind of sensibility, um, you know, kind of permeates a lot of what Adam was uh, doing and thinking about. And I, I found that very um, inspiring. Uh, really, over the years, um, I know I, I wrote my own last words piece uh, in after Adam wrote this one, and I remember as I was working on mine, it had to do with reproducing results and stuff like that. And I remember feeling very timid as I was doing that, and I got quite a lot of, enc a lot of encouragement from Robert Dale, who was the editor of Computational Linguistics at the time. And I also got a lot of encouragement by reading this and saying, "Well, you know what? It's okay to say something that maybe not everybody's going to like. You know, that may ruffle a few feathers." Uh, go ahead and do it. And so I, I did my best. I, I, I'm not sure how successful that was, but I, I did my best and, and certainly drew some inspiration from Adam's model there. Um, and so now Adam, as I mentioned early on, um, you know, provided this very wonderful and motivating compliment. Um, uh, he was not, however, um, always complimentary. And I remember soon after, maybe at the same event or the next event, you know, so this is 96, 97, um, talking to him about my dissertation research. And so my dissertation research was on word sense disambiguation, that is assigning a meaning to a word based on the context in which it occurs. And part of that work involved supervised learning, where you assume a fixed and finite sense inventory and you have some data, you have some sentences where human annotators have assigned meanings to a particular word, and then you convert that data into feature vectors, and you kind of turn it into a machine learning problem, and you, you build a classifier that will then assign meanings to those words that you have human annotations for. Um, uh, in those cases where you don't have it. So you build a model and you can assign uh, senses to words in previously unseen data. And I was quite proud of, you know, I was, I was among the few things that I did well probably was that I was pretty careful methodologically in terms of how I did experiments and in terms of how I was comparing my machine learning algorithms. I had a, a, a decent selection for the day of machine learning algorithms. Um, and I was uh, doing some things, you know, with, 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 things like log linear models that were at the time, you know, fairly new. And I, I was rather proud of it. And, and I, I gave my little pitch, you know, to Adam at some point. And he kind of looked at me and, and said, well, it's, it's a bit of nonsense, isn't it? And I was just devastated. I was like, oh, my God, nonsense? And it's the imposter syndrome, right? I mean, the imposter syndrome just comes roaring back. But he said, well, I mean, not all of it. Of course, not all of it. But, but what he took issue with, with was that fixed and finite sense inventory and, uh, and, 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 and made the point that, well, no, you know, language really isn't like that, is it? I mean, do we really have an absolute set of word meanings that we can use for a particular word in all the different contexts that may occur? 
you know, is that really what we want to do? And this was an important thing for me to hear uh, because I was being swept along in sort of the machine learning um, bandwagon, which sort of sort of roars on today, I know. And, and, uh, and I was, uh, once I had my data into this kind of feature vector format, uh, it kind of ceased to be language anymore. It was a classification problem. It could have been anything. And I thought that was good. I thought, well, this, this is great. This opens up the doors for all this kind of machine learning uh, that, that we can do. Um, but yeah, at the expense of losing track of what the problem really is. And, and so that was a very bracing reminder for me. Now, um, now, it's not to say that Adam was the only person who believed that. He, maybe it wasn't even the only person that said that to me. But in particular, his, um, his arguments, if you will, had particular resonance. And in particular, this paper, um, I don't believe in, in word senses. This came out in 1997. Um, in computers and the humanities, and it, it was based, I think, in, in you know some portion at least on his uh, his own PhD dissertation from 1993, the previously mentioned uh, polysemy, and um, this this had a tremendous impact on me. I mean, this this was something that I read, I thought about, and it made me think about my problem in a in a wholly different way. Um, that, 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 no, maybe this assumption about a finite sense inventory with clear boundaries, that's convenient. It's perfectly convenient, but maybe it's not really very much to do with language at all. Um, and um, that's where I started to, to, to think about, I, I mean, I really started to think then about the language aspects of my problem. I think before then I had been very much kind of a, a fairly traditional, typical sort of computer scientist who finds his way to a language problem and figures out a way to convert it into something that isn't a language problem. And so, um, so, so I know that Adam uh, really was, I think, thought quite a lot of, of some of the work that Henrik uh, Schutz had done at the time on automatic uh, word sense discrimination, where you try and discover senses and, and, uh, and, and without regard to any predefined labels or categories. And I th I'm, I'm almost certain it was through Adam's paper here that I began to discover um, uh, Henrik Schutz's, Schutz's work. And that led to actually a very long period of, of working on a, a, a project called Sense Clusters, where we kind of re-implemented a lot of those ideas and tried some other ideas and uh, continue to kind of work on that. But it, it, it's, one of the, it's one of these places where I can see a direction that my own work went off into. And Adam was, was certainly among the factors there. Um, in, in making that happen. Now, I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, my advisor, Rebecca Bruce, I think had a very clear vision as well that we would do both supervised and unsupervised methods because we didn't want to always assume the availability of sense tag text and so forth. So again, it's not the case that no one else told me or advised some of these things or suggested them, but it was, Adam certainly had a kind of unusual influence, um, perhaps in how he presented the arguments and his, uh, you know, both in person and in writing. And so this was, um, you know, this, this continues to be uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite papers, period. You know, just, I, I, I go back to this and rethink it and look at it. Um, and I think it's here where I kind of, I, I, I started to, uh, and, and so the paper argues, I should say a little bit, um, the paper argues that this assumption that word senses are kind of finite and atomic is just not true, and that and that we have to view word senses as uh, relative to a particular task, or um, you know, kind of channeling Wittgenstein a little bit. That that you know that that really meaning is use. You know that the way that the context. Uh, in which we're using a word, the, the topic under discussion, the domain, has a lot to do with the kinds of meanings we're going to see and that we're not necessarily going to see these finite categories all the time. And so I think, I, I, I think, you know, Adam actually, in some sense, believes in word senses, but not necessarily this 
particular kind of word sense, this very finite sort of descriptive, um, uh, you know, prescriptive view of what a word sense is. Um, one other thing I learned from Adam, I know for certain, is uh, lexicography. Uh, I think probably in this paper is where I first really encountered the notion of lexicography and what do lexicographers do and, and why is that interesting and why is that important and also how lexicographers have their own constraints. And so even if we as com computer scientists, computational linguists, admire dictionaries as a data source and stuff, it's important to remember that lexicographers are creating those dictionaries in, is it in a certain way because the market expects it, the public expects it, um, there are constraints on length and size and so forth, and so that we, we can't mistake a dictionary as, a, as kind of a true representation of meaning. It's subject to its own constraints. And this is the kind of thing I never would have, I mean, I, I never would have thought of that or even considered that. I, I probably wouldn't have known much about lexicographers. Um, and so last summer I was I was in, in Romania for a, a small workshop and, and I spent a lot of time talking about uh, dictionaries, the history of dictionaries, lexicography and things like that, which if I look back to, you know, to myself, you know, you know, in 1996, grinding out machine learning algorithms, uh, the idea that I'd give a talk like that is just inconceivable, but there we are. Um, so, um, you know, so, so, so Adam's influence on me was, 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 was early uh, in my career, uh, and I guess relatively early in his own, although I never, I never thought of him as at a similar sort of stage of life as myself. He always seemed wiser, at least. I, I don't know that he seemed older, but he seemed wiser. And um, uh, we, we uh, you know, were of relatively similar ages, a little bit older than I am, and interestingly enough, we both um, spent about five years doing other things between our bachelor's degrees and our graduate degrees. Um, and that's not always the case, and, and I think that's, I don't know that that has any particular significance other than in, in the fact that it makes his passing, um, you know, kind of all the more um, unsettling in a way. I mean, just, you know, thinking about life and my own life uh, in, in, in those kinds of terms. Um, so, um, um, so, so that's, those are some of the early influences, if you will. Um, in uh, January, I guess, of 2015, Adam started keeping a blog that uh, where, is where he shared his health news and, and talked about in, in quite a bit of detail, actually, about what was happening in terms of his health. Uh, and then sharing thoughts and then collecting and responding to quite a lot of comments from, from people around the world. And um, I wanted to kind of be a part of that. I thought, I thought it was wonderful that Adam was kind of uh, sharing himself that way and talking about such difficult things. And so, um, you know, I tried to respond, make comments uh, from time to time. And I, uh, I know I kind of tried to imagine myself in sort of a similar situation. and. I thought, well, probably what I'd like to hear might just be sort of the ordinary what's going on around the corner, or up the up the street, or in your backyard. And um, in in my case here, in the case in uh, in northern Minnesota, uh, which is where my shirt my shirt advertises that, um, on Sundays I wear um, sweatshirts. That's that's my thing on the Sabbath. Um, so anyway. Um, so I shared, I didn't share anything too deep or profound in these, in these um, responses to his blog, uh, but I talked about the weather, I talked about the wildlife that I was seeing um, in the backyard, in fact, and I uh, talked about bird feeding and, and how, uh, you know, bird feeding in northern Minnesota draws all kinds of creatures. Um, chipmunks and squirrels, of course, beyond the birds. The birds are spectacular. I mean, all different variety of woodpecker, um, so many different kinds of birds. And while they don't come to the feeders, we even have eagles, you know, I mean, bald eagles soaring around and stuff. And it's, it's just marvelous. Uh, a lot of hawks um, they, they, and geese, they use Lake Superior as a navigation uh, tool. And so uh, my house is uh, probably a five minute walk from Lake Superior. And so wonderful, um, symphonies of geese uh, flying over at all times of the day, um, especially in the spring and the fall as they migrate. Um, so anyway, I tried to talk about a little bit of those things. 
and um, um, you know, just to uh, provide a little bit of a picture of, of what life was like uh, here in Minnesota. And um, one of the issues that was occurring, and this was in springtime of 2015, is that um, uh, we have bears, black bears, and they uh, they come, and they if they find bird f bird food or a bird feeder, they just ravage it. I mean, they first they eat the bird seed, and then they like, in like a fit of ecstasy or something, I don't know what it is, but they just like destroy the bird feeder and they tear it up and they fling it off into the distance, and it's almost kind of comical. I mean, it's almost like you could have just taken the seed, right? I mean, but but no, they just destroy it, and it's like you know, kind of like raging Vikings or something, and and of the of the Norse type, not the football. American type thing. Um, but in any case, so those were the kinds of things I was sharing with Adam. And um, as the spring went on, as we got into April, it was clear that, you know, things weren't going as, as Adam hoped, as we all hoped. And he had a blog post, um, very end of April, that, um, that was titled Maybe the Last, and it, referring to maybe the last blog post, which was kind of a heartbreak, heartbreaking thing. Uh, to see. And I know that, um, you know, I obviously wanted to respond to that in some ways. And so I found myself um, thinking about uh, this conference in Mexico, the Sickling 2003 conference, where Adam was there, I was there, numerous other people were there. And it was really a really a, a, a very wonderful event. It's, I, I, I remember that conference quite clearly for a lot of different reasons. And one of them is that Adam was there. It was an opportunity to spend more time with Adam than I normally uh, you know, do. And um, I know that Adam and I were among the invited speakers along with Eric Brill and Aravind Joshi, Joshi. And talk about imposter syndrome. Holy moly, what am I doing there with those people? I mean, that was my feeling. And, and I, I maybe still have it, kind of. Um, but um, uh, but I remember um, uh, there was a panel discussion that Adam, Eric, and I uh, were a part of, and it was preceded by some individual presentations, as these as these things often are. And and here's Adam making his presentation uh, at that event, and you can't probably read it in the background uh, on that whiteboard. Uh, it says, what does it say? It says, a resource that classifies words by similarity. And that's one of the things he was talking about. And this was just so, again, motivating for me to hear because I had been, uh, you know, with various of my, of my students kind of working on sort of the early days of the WordNet similarity package and really kind of devoting a lot of time in, in just getting that right. And I, and I was thinking, yeah, I mean, right. I mean, it is a resource, you know, for measuring similarity, for classifying by similarity. And Adam was kind of arguing in general why these resources are important and useful. And it was coming again at the right time because I think it was, I was kind of at a point where it was kind of time to decide, do I push further with that or do I move off to something else? And I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Um, but in part, you know, and, and certainly not only due to Adam's comments, but, but they certainly contributed to, to a decision to continue pushing forward with essentially uh, what ended up happening was essentially a rewrite of WordNet similarity top to bottom that took place, you know, you know like 2003 to 2005 and made, I think, the, the code very uh, robust and it, it continues to, to work pretty well and people still use it and things like that. And so again, at kind of a pivotal moment, Adam pops up and, and, and says something that really kind of affects me. And, and I, I thought that was just great. And here's, here's actually a picture during Adam's presentation. And if you look at me there, I'm like, I don't know, I'm apparently hypnotized or something. Um, I'm really listening, and normally I'm a I'm, I'm a big note taker. If you ever see me at these things, I've got I've usually got like a little notebook, and I'm writing furiously. And um, I can't find a notebook for this session or anything. And I think I was just listening, and I was also talking and stuff. So I didn't want to guess I'd be sitting up in the front, kind of um, taking notes. Is I don't know what. Um, 
not the done thing. Um, but there was another photo that I came across, and these are all on the Sickling 2003 website. So you can, if you just look for Sickling 2003, you can find these pictures and many more. And this is, I just love this picture. This is like, this is like my relationship with the rest of the world most of the time. And that's me sort of genially probably taking the middle path avoiding controversy uh, to beat the band, uh, terrified of being exposed as a fraud. And Adam is making this face, you know, and it's like, I don't know, I don't remember, I, I, I don't remember what was going on here, but this, this face he's making, it's sort of like, you know, it's a bit of nonsense sort of face again. So I, I don't know, I must have said something. Um, but it was a really, um, that was really a, a, a really great um, experience. Um, just that whole, uh, the whole conference and then the interactions with Adam and the kind of the inspirational uh, words that he shared about similarity, you know, in general, which again, is he the only person that talks about that? No, a lot of people talk about that. But again, the way that he said it, the time he said it, um, resonated. Um, and um, in, in my response to his, um, his blog post, um, I mentioned thinking about the Sickling Conference, um, and not really these technical details, I'm providing those as sort of a, as a, as a, a context uh, for why this was an important event for me. Uh, but I, 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 I mentioned and remembered the, the soccer match, or the football game, I should call it football for goodness sake, right? Um, that uh, Adam instigated, I think, at the end of the, of, of the conference. And it was, it was lovely. Um, it was, um, Mexico City, is, is, as people who know me know, is one of my favorite places. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I like the art, by the way, you can see in the background some of that. And um, there's also a, a, one of the other things that is, is always kind of intrigued me about Mexico City is that um, despite the reputation of, of being smoggy and dirty and all the rest, it can actually be very lovely, um, especially around twilight. And there's kind of a sort of a, the shadows get long and there's kind of a luminous quality to the light very briefly. And this soccer game was kind of taking place later in the afternoon, a football match, right? Not a soccer game, a football match, for goodness sake. And um, and so the, the game was being played, the match was being played under those conditions. And there's a picture here that, um, that I like very much. Uh, and this is Adam in the yellow. And uh, he is uh, in fine form there. That little figure over there in the blue shorts, he's waving his arm for the ball, actually. I'm pretty certain that's his son, Boris, who traveled with him uh, to, the, um, to the conference and, and, and various of the excursions. And you can see those long shadows. I might be one of them. I didn't take this picture, but I was kind of standing on the sidelines. I wasn't playing because I had worn the wrong kind of shoes to play soccer in. And, um, you know, you can see Adam was prepared. He was ready to play soccer. Look at those shoes. He was ready. I wasn't. Um, and um, in any case, um, I wrote about that soccer match. And, and one of the things I remembered about it was that Adam had sort of insisted, well, there needed to be some kind of, you know, adult beverage, like beer probably, available. And so someone went off and got some beer, and 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 it was not like a big, loud, raucous party. This is a, a you know a, a, a small group of you know fairly tame academics, you know, standing around watching soccer, drinking uh, beer occasionally, um, and somehow security, police, whoever appear. And there's some conversation that I wasn't a part of. I don't know if they took some of the beer or what it was, kind of a quality assurance test or something. But they, they finally went around. I just, it was just one of those kind of curious moments. Um, and, and then the game continued. Um, and I just kind of shared that memory with Adam. And, um, and it was very nice. Um, there was a, a follow-up to that from Boris, his, his son, who, had, who said some really nice things about the conference and how much he had enjoyed it and remembered it uh, even now. Um, and Adam responded by, you know, the foot, you know, yeah, the football match. I mean, that was the one where the dog came and chewed up the ball, which I had kind of not remembered, believe it or not. But the, the, the match actually ended with a dog just kind of racing onto the field, grabbing the ball and biting it and probably, I think, bursting it, basically. And that just ended the match. And it was just this kind of weirdly magical sort of, in, you know, fascinating thing. That, um, that, that just was really all very nice. And Adam seemed to have some fond memories of that. And so I was, I was happy to you know, kind of be sharing that with him. And, and also even uh, Boris apparently had some memories of that as well. Um, 
And so it wasn't, it didn't turn out, that didn't turn out to be the last message on the blog. Um, the last, one of the last messages after that, a few days after that, there was a message posted um, entitled Cancer and Depression, which was um, something I still think about. Um, and, and of all the things that I remember and think about Adam now, despite everything I've said about the impact on my work and research and so forth, I've thought more about what he describes here probably than all those other things. Um, and, and, and it's because what he said was, was so genuine and so moving and I think true. And, uh, and I'll just read a very little bit here at the beginning. Um, and he said, um, which is worse, cancer or depression? The answer is clear. Depression is worse. Depression makes you want to die, and cancer doesn't. And it was, you know, kind of a, a, a stunning thing to read. And he goes on, and he says, I've spent all my adult, adult life with depression lurking. I haven't mentioned it to very many people at all. Um, for the first 10 years, I talked about it to nobody. And again, this is this is a very moving thing, and, and we're thinking of Adam here sort of... of, of you know, dealing with, with cancer and then learning of this kind of long-running battle of, with, with depression. Um, and it's a long, difficult battle that he describes. And he, he goes on to, this is not the whole, um, I'm not going to read everything here, but I'm going to make the link available in the comments below the video. And I really hope that if you look at anything further from what I've said today, um, that, that you'll take a look at that and read through that. I think it's real important. Um, and so he talked about um, uh, the nature of his depression, and he said um, a little bit later, uh, my depression has taken cyclical form with a nine-month bout every three years. Um, I worked this out in the late 1990s. And so this is after I had first met him before the event in Sickling. And um, it's just kind of a, a sobering thing to realize that this, this very energetic um, you know, dynamic person who I really admired was, as he was kind of providing this kind of encouragement to me and doing fine work, suffering from this really difficult and kind of frightening thing. Um, and um, I, I have, you know, had my own uh, experiences uh, w with depression, not for myself so much, but, but people around me I, I have known or suspected have suffered from these issues and it's it's very difficult um, and um, he goes on to uh, to talk a little bit more uh, about this sort of cyclic nature of it um, and said my, my depression followed in a slowly in quickly out pattern over the summer I would start feeling gloomy more and more often and this continued through autumn to blackest days of winter sometime in spring the first echo of something I scarcely dared hope for or believe in opened up just for a moment and I, you know, from what I've learned about depression over the years, I think what he's describing is, is, is it's a very clear description of, of what may be a kind of common experience, a sort of cyclic waves and so forth. Um, he also goes on to say that, you know, one surprising fact for me was that people didn't notice. Um, but in truth, he goes on to say uh, that, you know, perhaps they did notice, but we're just too polite to say. And I think he's actually got it right there. I think a lot of the times um, when people notice someone who is perhaps a little more withdrawn than usual or perhaps saying things that are, you know, a little, sound a little maybe empty or hopeless, you know, those kinds of, using those kinds of words or, or words that describe those kinds of feelings, um, we don't know how to respond and so we try to be polite and we just sort of don't say anything um, and and he goes on to say that right after that but maybe that is just a very English interpretation that is that people were too polite to say anything and I would say no that's not just English that's American too I mean right we're the land of rugged individuals and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and so if you see or sense someone in some kind of distress I think there's a real reluctance to to, to, to say something and just to, to, you know, to ask, you know, you know, or to say, you know, I've noticed this is a little different. Um, is there anything you'd like to talk about? Um, and I think it just takes that, actually, 
Um, I don't think, you know, I, I think sometimes people are afraid to maybe talk about or raise the issue with someone because then they're going to have to, they're going to be expected to be like a, kind of a stand-in therapist or something. And they're going to, you know, have to talk about, you know, ask questions and do all this kind of stuff. And I think that's exactly not what people want. Nobody, you know, nobody really probably wants to turn a friend into a therapist. Um, it's more so just about listening and being available to listen um, and as I read through this, this very moving um, um, post, um, it just reminded me of how important it is to be um, both aware of the people around us and, and willing to listen and, and maybe to ask a question that might be a little awkward. Um, and, 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 and also, should anyone say anything like that to us, you know, to be open you know, to, to, to not take that as kind of a prying gesture, but to take it as a kind of sign of concern and respond accordingly. Um, and so um, towards the end of this post, um, he talks about what I think is another kind of common situation, and that is he felt he was doing pretty well. He was on some medication that was working, and so he decided to stop the medication. And what happens when you do that is you go into a tailspin. And that sounds like what happened. Um, and sort of sadly enough, from what I can interpret here, it sounded like some of the physical examinations that were relating to what he felt might be symptoms from depression turned out to be where his, his cancer was discovered. Um, and so um, it's just a very moving picture here of, of Adam's life, and I think we learn a lot about the nature of depression, what it's like to live with that, and as I say again, I think the importance of being willing to listen, and not to try to step in and fix anything, but to listen and to be available. And it's, it's, it's something that's hard to do. It's hard to do it right. I, I, I recently had a situation where I think I slightly mishandled a, a situation like that. I'm trying to work out exactly how to you know how to how to do better, um, and 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 just reading this post again and thinking about it um, has made me realize. Yeah, I really need to do that. I really need to do that. So, so even now, uh, Adam's kind of um, providing some ins inspiration for me and so forth. Um, the other thing that I did in that post was I I, I had been hunting around to try and find uh, a picture of this bear. I had taken a few pictures, not this last, that summer that it was, or the spring it was happening, um, but the previous spring and summer, I know I had been able to take some photographs of, of the bear. I think it's been the same bear, actually, for like three years now, um, and that's not unusual. They, they, there's enough woods in and around Duluth where bears can kind of find a, a, a habitat, if you will, and, and um, you know, they migrate around a bit, but they can, um, sort of sustain a life in the community. And, and so this is a picture I took the previous summer of the bear. And you can see that's actually a pretty big bear, right? And you'll actually see beneath it is a bird feeder that has been um, uh, ripped apart. This one not as bad as others, but that's the bear. And so I just sent that and said, you know, uh, in, in that message uh, responding to the um, post about um, cancer and depression, I uh, talked again about the weather and uh, also that the bear seems to have moved on, you know. But here's a picture from, from last year, just because I thought it was um, to add a little sort of visual documentation of the, of, of the bear. And so, um, so soon after um, these, these, the cancer and depression po post, I think within about two weeks is when Adam passed away, which would be a year ago tomorrow. Um, and um, it's still uh, it, it's still very surprising in some way and and, and, and so uh, so terribly unfortunate and I've, I've um, uh, been remembering some other things that I uh, there was one other thing I really always noticed about Adam and uh, he has a has a, a very nice web page. Has a lot of good content. Uh, this is this is what it looks like if you go there. And for years and years and years, you just look for Adam Kilgore and you'll find it. For years and years and years, I know there's been this little thing on his web page. A footnote. A footnote. 
And so, who has a footnote on a web page? Um, and and I, it's been there forever. And I just, um, and so if you click on the footnote, I'm going to kill the surprise for you here, but if you haven't clicked on the footnote, you ought to click on the footnote. But, but there's this little thing. My great aunt was Wittgenstein's typist. And I've just always loved that. And this might sort of show my provincial American side at, at work here, but I always felt that, that was like one of the most British things I'd ever seen. Um, this kind of very understated yet sort of erudite comment like, uh, you know, no, my great aunt wasn't Wittgenstein's, you know, lover or something like that. A typist, you know, it wasn't my mother. Uh, it was my great aunt. And so, no, I'm not trying to insert myself into Wittgenstein's life here, really. Just, just a minor connection that I thought I would point out. I always wanted to ask him more about that. I've been very intrigued by this great aunt. And I always wanted to ask him more about that. And I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't. Um, and so, um, since Adam's passing, there have been numerous wonderful uh, tributes. There's been, a, 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 I, th I think, a real outpouring of esteem and affection. Um, there have been a few kind of formal, if you will, obituaries that have appeared, which, which have been, I thought, very moving. Um, one of them appeared in the journal Computational Linguistics um, by, by Roger Evans, his, his PhD supervisor. Um, and uh, it's freely available online. It's a very, and it's a very clear and, and, um, and, and lovely portrait of, of Adam. Um, you, you can find another that appeared in the International Journal of Lexicography by Michael Rundle um, that, again, uh, you know, does, does, does justice uh, uh, to Adam's legacy as much as a relatively short piece can. Um, there's a book uh, planned by, by um, I think it's Springer, uh, with uh, kind of essays in honor of Adam Kilgariff and various contributions. Um, my own, uh, the only thing I've really been involved with, um, I'm, I regret to say, I've, I feel like I should have done more given all of these influences that I'm talking about, but there's recently, in, in Sickling 2016, there's a, a, there's a paper, Adam Kilgariff's Legacy to Computational Linguistics and Beyond. Um, I contributed probably the least of anyone to this, to be honest. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have been a part of it in some small way. Um, and uh, uh, at some point, uh, I hope to be able to explain to Adam why I wasn't able to do more. Um, and I, I, in a sense, look forward to having that opportunity. Um, and so, um, as I say, um, I, I felt like I sh probably should have said or done more to, to you know, kind of remember Adam. And so with the one year, um, the passage of one year coming up tomorrow, I thought at least I could do this. And I, I see that I've gone well beyond my usual uh, time uh, expectations. This is the perils of, of being an academic. Um, I'm going to drag it on just a little bit longer because um, a month or two ago, um, I awoke, looked out into the backyard, and there's a book, there's a there's a bird feeder, ripped up, just torn apart, thrown here and there. First thing that came to my mind was Adam's back, and I thought, after a moment, I thought, well, how interesting is that? I mean, here I've I've constructed maybe this kind of sense of Adam that means something like. Uh, a bear that ravages bird feeders in Ted Peterson's backyard in northern Minnesota or something. What an extraordinary sense. And it, it's a very meaningful sense to me. I don't know that it exists in the same sense as like something we might see in Oxford English Dictionary or whatever. But, but that's a, you know, to me that's a real sense. And I think that shows kind of the fun and the, the fascinating properties of, of words and their meanings and semantics. And so, uh, so yeah, I don't, I, maybe I don't believe in word senses either, but I, I, I really love them despite that. And so, um, and I think Adam uh, may have felt something similar, but certainly uh, he gave me quite a lot to think about and to work with. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I, I, I wish that there were time, I wish I could talk to him about this bear thing, you know, and that, that, is that a sense or it's a metaphor probably or something? What is that? How do we deal with things like that? I think it'd be a great conversation. And, um, you know, I guess 
you know, maybe there'll be a chance at some point in the future. So um, thank you for, for listening. <laughs>